Thanks so much, Dan. Um, first of all, yeah, big, uh, huge thanks to Dan Dawson for the invitation. Um, it's been a while um, organizing this. I also want to thank Leah and Bill, who have been really patient in the, in the, you know, making this happen. Essentially, after after a number of months of um, you know having to postpone for, for as as Dan said, reasons that we're pretty familiar with. Um, also, thank you, Dan, for the for the kind introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to uh, present some of uh, some of this uh, research I've been working on for the last uh, two or three years, actually, for the um for the Cornell Latin American and Caribbean uh, Studies program. Right. Um. So let me just launch in here. I'm already sharing my screen, I believe. So, Refracted Empire. This um. This uh, project has evolved quite a bit actually since I since I initially pitched it to Dan as a um, as a topic uh, for this um, for this talk, um, but I will I will try to keep it uh, you know got, not get too far off track. Um, but I still want to try to come back to this notion of a of a refracted empire, um, the idea that islands in the Eastern Atlantic. Um, uh, and, and events that happen there and, and patterns that can be linked to those islands and people who resided in them sometimes um, can very much change and enrich our understanding of the development of the early uh, Spanish Caribbean. So that's sort of my, where I'm, where I'm heading, right? Okay, so I want to start my little stopwatch so I don't go far, far, far over time here. All right. Um, so what I have to begin with here to start off with are a couple of images of um, you know, standard depictions of, uh, you know, the Spain's Indies fleets, the Carrera de Indias in the 16th and 17th centuries. Um, this has often been seen as the backbone of Spain's uh, Atlantic empire, as it's often been called, um, or as sort of the, uh, there's some really colorful phrases by historians like uh, Perry and Irene Wright and uh, uh, John Elliott and uh, you know, sort of classic works. Uh, that uh, that portray the Indies fleets as these uh, um, structural elements um, that make Spanish colonization of the Americas possible, and that tie different regions of the Americas claimed by Spain uh, back to the Iberian Peninsula um, in a in a variety of ways. And so here's one illustration that I that I love from um, uh, you know this large collection right by the uh, famous collection among. Uh, a subset of historians, including myself, um, by uh, Huguet and Pierre Chanou, called Seville and the Atlantic. Wonderful classic study uh, from the Annals School uh, of, of Scholarship uh, for, you know, in the late 50s. Um, definitely worth checking out if you have any interest in this type of, of topic. Um, I often uh, use, as, as I'm doing right now, I often use images or, or um, uh, aspects of the Shanu's, you know, monumental work to criticize um, what I see, what I see as uh, um, not sufficiently nuanced approaches to uh, uh, overseas uh, connections and uh, transatlantic travel and trade and migration. Um, but I will let me go ahead and say at the outset, I think the Shanu's have had a very nuanced understanding. Um, and if you, if anyone goes through and reads their their footnotes. Um, some, you know, they frequently say, well, things are not uh, as, as straightforward as they appear. Um, so it's been very useful for me. This has been a resource that's been very useful for me. Um, that said, uh, and this image is a good, um, sort of a good uh, uh, glimpse of this, uh, a, of a particular vision of the Caribbean and Spanish Americas in relation to, almost exclusively in relation to Seville. You know, they, they use terms like the near and far Atlantic based on how long it took um, for a vessel to travel from Seville to a place in the Americas or return from a place in the Americas to Seville, right? So it's an interesting, um, fascinating, very useful work, but with these sorts of limitations. So let me go on to my next slide here. Another uh, uh, classic uh, articulation uh, is by Myrtle McLeod and is, I mean, really a classic uh, uh, in the Cambridge history of Latin America and in the volume devoted to, um, to the colonial period. This is just a wonderful, um, you know, a wonderful essay with a lot of rich and colorful language that I like to use, um, you know, semi-humorously sometimes, but it's also very useful. Um, so here, I wanna talk about this model. And this is, you know, I chose this one because it, it, it does a good job of um, summarizing this um, 
perspective that we often teach when we teach colonial Latin America, you know, particularly uh, trade in the sort of Spanish uh, empire, um, sort of the, the Indies fleets, this roughly circular route where ships depart from Seville or San Lucar de Barrameda and later from Cadiz, and they, and they travel across the Atlantic, in this case, actually passing through the Canary Islands here of this, and then once they pass the Lesser Antilles, they split. You have one group of galleons going down to Cartagena de Indias and to Porto Bello, or Nombre de Dios earlier, and then up to Havana. And then you have the other group, uh, the, the flota, right, going over to Veracruz and, and, and Mexico, and then back to Havana. And then the fleets, sometimes together, sometimes separately, uh, then return back to Seville. And this is sort of the... And also, uh, interestingly, you have this indication here that the fleets pass through the Azores or very close to the Azores on the way back. Um, so this is, in a sense, a more, a more nuanced articulation of this system than we often, um, than we often find. Sometimes, we, you know, it's not a common to see just a, just a line. I mean, if I, were, <laughs> if I were drawing this, it probably would have been just a straight line, right? Um, um, if, I mean, if I were drawing this and weren't particularly trying to understand how this, how this system, if it was a system, actually worked, um, or, or who were the people involved and where were they and that sort of thing. So these are a couple of, um, just wanna open with these images because I think this sort of um, understanding of these direct connections, Spain, the Caribbean, particular ports, specific, specifically in the Caribbean, um, have become sort of, um, standard depictions and not only understanding the way that Spain allegedly um, supposedly uh, orchestrated this you know, massive imperial enterprise. This has also been really important for understanding the history of the Caribbean, Spanish Caribbean. This is arguably after, you know, after Columbus, the, the institution of the Indies fleets, institutionalization of the Indies fleets in the 1560s um, has become sort of, uh, it's often seen as the big structural factor that shaped the Caribbean for the next, you know, hundreds of years, essentially. Um, so this notion that there were a few key port cities like Santo Domingo, um, particularly, that were became shut off from, you know, um, isolated from this official route and then languished and, you know, became obsolete and poor. And people moved away if they hadn't already moved, right, this, as the story goes. Um, that these new cities or, or cities that had been less prosperous, uh, like Havana and like Cartagena de Indias, became much more important the, at, thanks to, in large part, to the Indies fleet. So, um, you know, uh, Castillo Matthews' book on, on Cartagena, sort of a classic study, uh, Alejandro de la Fuente's uh, book uh, on uh, Havana, Havana and the Atlantic, right? These are, you know, these are books that um, tackle this uh, subject, among, among other works that do. Um, and so it's clear that the Indies fleets were historically important. But one of the questions that I've had, um, well, I mean, it's not even a question anymore. Now I just want to kind of, kind of prove that uh, uh, dynamic wrong. Um, but one of the questions that I've had is um, what happens to all these places uh, that were yeah, not necessarily directly connected to the main route of the Indies fleets all the time? Um, you know, what, uh, what's happening in these places? Um, what part places are they connected to? Um, so there's been some really useful scholarship on regional trade networks within the Caribbean that I'll talk about in a second. Um, and there's also been a few people have articulated. So again, back to Alejandro de la Fuente articulates in his book uh, 12 years ago or so on, on Havana, these sort of alternate Atlantic uh, networks um, is possibility. Um, but, you know, one place that I've become very interested in looking at in the last, really in the last, you know, three or four years, and this is an extension of my research, uh, largely in collaboration with Mark Eagle, uh, who's at Western Kentucky University. We, for a long time now, we've been working on uh, the transatlantic slave trade from about 1500 to 1650. We're starting to publish uh, on this. Um, but one of the things that we did was to was to, we spent a lot of time with the Shaw News, certainly, but one of the things that we did was to go through um, uh, uh, records in the archive of the Indies in Seville uh, that were recorded in ports all across Spanish America, right? uh, particularly in the Caribbean, but we also looked at a few other places, um, Buenos Aires most notably, but you know, mostly ports in and around the Caribbean, um, something like, I mean, we're in the 20s, 
20-ish ports, 25, I think. There's some we haven't looked at, you know, exhaustively yet. We've been looking at these for a while. And um, one of the, and Mark's written about this a little bit separately too. So I recommend checking out his work on Hispaniola if you, if you get a chance. Um, but it's been interesting to see where ships are arriving from. These, these, these records show, you know, a good glimpse for selected years of the maritime traffic that was actually showing up in the Caribbean. In many cases, long after the Indies fleets uh, stopped regularly passing through Puerto Rico or Hispaniola or Jamaica, or and, you know, we don't have a lot for Jamaica, but but we have a lot of interesting information for a lot of ports um, uh, that we you know were never expecting to find. So we had been looking mainly for vessels that carried enslaved Africans, right? We were looking for slave ships. We ended up we find a lot, but we also found a lot of other things. And so this project has been sort of a spinoff in a sense um, of that, I would say. So to sort of focus a little bit on the Canary Islands, which is where I'm mainly heading today. Um, the Shanus, I want, this is something I noticed uh, about seven or eight years ago, the Shanus had all these references to um, voyages that went from the Canaries to the Americas, to Spanish America. But as the Shanus often know, um, they don't have much specific information, if any, about them. So here's an example of one image um, that shows, this is from 1550. And this shows that at the very bottom of the page, I have a little red, um, you know, in a red uh, rectangle, 25 ships going to the Indies, leading from La Palma, from the island of La Palma in the Canaries. 17 ships going to the Indies, leaving from San Cristobal, from La Laguna, San Cristobal de La Laguna, so, which is not a port, so presumably from um, Santa Cruz, um, the city's port. In the island of Tenerife, so um, so this this happens frequently. I think I have yeah my little um, text at the top of the slide here. The Sean and I added them all up, and from about 1548, 1589, this period of a slightly over 40 years, they mentioned almost 700 voyages like this that left from the Canary Islands, and mainly, and their information was mainly from the two islands of Tenerife and La Palma, um, that went to the to the Americas. Um, that, that we don't know anything about. So they have thousands of voyages recorded here, but there's also this significantly large subset of vessels um, that left from the Canary Islands about which, you know, they can offer almost no information. They do offer information about many other ships from the Canaries, but mostly after 1590. So the Canaries play this role in the 16th century that I believe is not very well understood vis-a-vis um, -vis the Americas, vis-a-vis -vis Spanish America, particularly the Caribbean. Um, one last thing I would mention on this on this slide is that the Canaries are, and I mean, there's scholarship mostly produced in the Canaries that recognizes this. The, the Canaries were a major loophole in any sort of, um, you know, uh, aspiration to a mercantilist or closed off imperial system. Starting in 1508, the beginning of the 16th century, just five years after the house, Spain's house of trade, the Casa de la Contratación, just five years after this imperial institution is often portrayed as being all powerful, right? Um, just five years that was, after it was formed, residents in the Canary Islands receive a royal cedula authorizing them to trade directly with the Americas, to trade directly with Spanish settlements in the Americas. And this primarily means the Caribbean at this stage. Um, and so, at which they which they do. I mean, you, they, you know, there's, uh, and I'll get to this in a second too. There's a huge amount of sources, source material in the Canary Islands uh, that shows uh, voyages as early as the 1520s, and probably, probably, almost certainly sooner. We know that Columbus, for example, uh, stopped in the Canary Islands, also in Madeira, also in the Cape Verde Islands, also in the Azores, in each of his four, um, one or more, right, of those um, archipelagos in each of his four voyages to the Caribbean. So really from the beginning of, um, of, of uh, Spanish settlement in the Americas and Spanish expansion or invasion in the Americas, there's this, uh, there's this uh, uh, branch coming from the Canary Islands, this link from the Canary Islands. Um, there's, uh, I was recently teaching um, using Bernal Diaz de Castillo's the History of the Conquest of New Spain, sort of a classic, um, for me, wonderful source to teach with. And one of the things Bernal Diaz mentions is then the ship arrived from the Canary Islands, right, in the early 1520s in um, Mexico. So there's this, um, you know, uh, really interesting and potentially very significant, I think, um, loophole, as, as I said, in this um, 
in our understanding of the structure of commerce and migration um, and movement in general um, um, in the Atlantic, uh, it, particularly in relation to the Caribbean, the Span early Spanish Caribbean. And this lasts throughout the 16th, 17th century and beyond. So it's, um, I'll, so I'll talk a little bit more about the historiography in a second. Um, but I, so I wanted to just point out that the Shanus recognized this. They said, okay, the Canaries exist. The House of Trade did have an office in the Canaries, um, or, you know, and, and officials in, in the plural Canary Islands. Um, but much of the uh, information that they generated was never sent uh, uh, back to Seville or was lost if it was sent to Seville. All right. So there is, as I mentioned, there's, um, there's a, one of the reasons that I think is very useful to look at the Canary Islands. Um, if we're thinking really, if we're really thinking about the Caribbean in the 16th and 17th century, there's a number of reasons that it's useful to look at the Canary Islands. Um, first of all, is this um, extant scholarship on Macronesia. Uh, the, uh, which is the name, right, of these, these four archipelagos, uh, the Azores, Madeira, uh, the Canary Islands, and the Cape Verde Islands. Those are the main uh, inhabited archipelagos of um, Macronesia. Um, and so there's, there's excellent scholarship already done on Macronesia. Um, here's, for example, classic work by um, Antonio Vieira, um, inter-island commerce, right? So this is kind of a classic work looking at the early 16th century. And here he's mainly looking at exchange between Madeira, uh, the Azores, and the Canary Islands. Unusual in that he also incorporated um, the Canaries. So a lot of scholarship um, written in Spanish also has addressed, you know, usually particular Canary Islands or the Western Canary Islands or the Eastern Canary Islands um, in relation to other parts of the world. And they have a section on uh, yeah, links to Madeira, links to, um, you know, links to the Cape Verde Islands, for example. So there's uh, there's a bunch of good a good scholarship on this. It's all written in almost exclusively written in Spanish or in Portuguese. Um, um, but it's, it's wealth of material. And I'll point to a little bit more of that in a second. Um, but what I want to uh, emphasize here is this notion that my my feeling that the that the Canaries and, Mac and Macronesia at this context in general is a wonderful model for the early Caribbean, early Spanish Caribbean particularly because it gives us a great way of thinking about interconnected regional circuits. So within each of these archipelagos, uh, so particularly think of the Canaries, for example, or the Cape Verde Islands, these islands have their own internal circuits, right? So in the Canaries uh, and Tenerife, they might export, uh, you know, uh, wine or, um, you know, or sugar early on or something. They might, they might export things to other places that are farther away. But there's also these inter-island trades from La Gomera or Hierro or from Lanzarote or, or in, in Gran Canaria, Tenerife. These are, all these islands are in connection with one another. And you have often voyages that will stop in one island, uh, do some business there, maybe pick up crew, maybe drop off passengers and make some trade and then go to the neighboring island where they, you know, continue the next stage. Um, sometimes you will have a ship parked in one island where the crew of the ship, or at least its shipmaster or captain, are you know uh, uh, leaving a documentary trail in an, in a different island, with, you know, with plans to go back to their ship for the next voyage, right, or to sell their ship even. So, um, which I'll come back to in a second. But so, within this context of, of Macronesia, these each archipelago with its internal trade circuits, it also has connections to the neighboring archipelagos. Um, and so I have my little uh, uh, simple diagram here with the, with the curved arrows, um, but this is very much based on my reading and my understanding of, um, of the works of scholars who are based, um, you know, who, well, who write mainly in Spanish and Portuguese. Um, I've been particularly reading the ones who are people who are based in the Canaries, which has been, uh, which has been a lot of fun. Uh, there's you know, this amazing historiography. Um, so let me, let me go on a bit more. Um, oh, one last thing I want to say about the... Um, uh, archipelagos of the uh, of Macronesia, they're much much smaller than the islands we're interested in and the populations we're interested in in the early Spanish Caribbean. So these, in terms of territory, these islands are pretty small. I mean, compared especially to like Cuba or Hispaniola or even Puerto Rico, right? These are these are not big islands. If you compare to uh, you know mainland areas, uh, so in the southern littoral of the Caribbean, Venezuela, you know, the province of Cartagena, Riohacha, Santa Mar, this you know this whole this huge swath of territory. Like there's, there's not a really good um, uh, 
it's very difficult to draw direct comparisons uh, in terms of uh, uh, size, right? Or even um, connections to uh, neighboring Iberian settlements. Um, actually, uh, the uh, Macronesian archipelagos have a different relationship to the mainland of Africa, right? which is also very, very interesting, um, but uh, tangential perhaps to what I wanna talk about now. So what I wanna say is that um, even though these islands, these archipelagos and the islands within them tend to be small in size, some of them are much more densely populated um, than the island settlements um, and even some of the mainland uh, settlements uh, in the Spanish Caribbean. Um, so uh, particularly islands in the Canaries, in the Azores, and in the Cape Verde Islands, uh, some of these islands are, are, are much more densely populated um, during this period, during the 16th and even into the early 17th century. All right, so one example of, uh, so I haven't mentioned Sao Tome and Principe, which is down here in the, I don't know if you can see my cursor, down here in the Gulf of Guinea. Other, other uh, archipelago, Atlantic islands, not part of Macronesia, but also very interesting. Um, I included this image because I wanted to show an example of previous scholarship that has tried to articulate um, overlapping and interconnected regional circuits um, and, uh, and and uh, pathways, maritime routes. And so here you have uh, you know, a really interesting, I think, representation of links between Lisbon to, uh, to Cape Verde Islands passing through the Canaries. You have a Canaries connection to the Upper Guinea coast. And then you have this um, maritime route that goes down to Sao Tome and Principe and Anubon. And then you have the circuits that link those islands in the Gulf of Guinea to um, El Mina and what's today Ghana. And, um, uh, and what they call the Rio dos Escravos, like the, the, the slave rivers in the kingdom of Benin in um, uh, Eastern Nigeria today. Um, so, so complex, interesting, fascinating. I think we could do something very similar uh, for the Caribbean, internal to the Caribbean, and to see the way um, the Caribbean connects to these other circuits. I mean, in this image, right, the the depiction of the Caribbean is, is very, very, uh, you know, not at all nuanced here. We have slaves in these two lines, slaves from the Cape Verde Island, slaves from Sao Tome going to the Antilles, which is you know, Eastern Cuba, Hispaniola, and Puerto Rico, right? So, so that's the very sort of, um, you know, uh, uh, very simple uh, uh, depiction of impact on the Caribbean. And, you know, and we can even push far beyond the Caribbean going to other parts of the Americas and, and beyond. Um, but so I wanna show an example of this um, uh, map and very short article by Maria Emilia Madeira Santos, uh, which has been influential for me in thinking, among other things have been um, in thinking about this. All right, so here is an example of, the, of some of the tax records that I mentioned. This is the type of source we use to um, type of source we've been able to use to look for, sh for vessels, for ships arriving in Spanish American ports. And this is an example from Veracruz. I chose it because it's really clear, uh, crisp and, and clear, easy to read. Um, uh, and this is a ship named, the, not really the Muffin, the Madalena, it's the Magdalena, uh, which uh, arrives, the, it names the, the, the shipmaster. It was a Basque sounding name. Um, and you know, it, it left from Seville and arrived in the port of San Juan de Lua in Veracruz on August 10th. Uh, 1572, right? So it's, and you can um, find information about the cargo, about the name of the, um, you know, the main officers or your shipmaster and captain and such, the date of arrival and the cargo, right? So if there's enslaved people aboard, for example, this is what um, Mark Eagle and I were looking for this kind of information. Um, uh, so there's, there's, there's material like this for almost all of the uh, ports of Spanish America, right? Um, um, unfortunately, you know, it's, it's patchy. Some places there's only a few years of this type of information have, have survived. So, so what's been interesting is based on uh, that sort of information for different Spanish American ports. Uh, here I've, I've chosen Yucatan, uh, uh, different ports in the Yucatan, which are all you know, lumped into one um, source, non legal. Um, it's possible to sort of compare. Uh, where are these different vessels coming from? And in this case, one of the reasons I like the Yucatan example is because we're, you know, we're looking with relatively small numbers here, um, but also for a, uh, you know, for a 16th century period that's that's not particularly well studied in terms of um, Atlantic maritime traffic. Um, um, but this is also Yucatan is supposed to be, you know, isolated and uh, far removed from the main routes of uh, of the Indies fleets, 
right? Um, so we could make this, you know, this is a, a good example. We could say the same thing about Puerto Rico or Santo Domingo or, you know, or, or in other places. Um, but one thing I like about this, um, you know, uh, this easily manageable example, shall we say, is that it shows that there were vessels arriving from Seville, and I use the category Seville here to also include San Lucar, um, Cadiz, that sort of whole area, um, you know, southwestern Andalusia, mostly Seville. And then we have, uh, you know, even larger number, slightly larger number of vessels arriving from the Canary Islands, in addition to two vessels arriving from the Cape Verde Islands. Um, and then, you know, a number that are unspecified. I think, I mean, I recognize the names of some of the ones that are unspecified, and I think they can be linked to uh, either Seville or to the Canaries for the most part. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a, each of these vessels has an you know, interesting story. We have information about the cargo that they carry. I'm particularly interested in the one that arrived in Bacalar, uh, which apparently is a wonderful uh, tourist resort now. Um, Cisal apparently is being renovated as a, as a, as a tourist resort, or was before the pandemic. Um, so hope I get to do some more research uh, in, in these places someday. But, uh, you know, uh, fascinating uh, uh, in, in this sort of transatlantic maritime traffic comparison, the Canary Islands were more important, right? Um, for the, um, let's see if I can move my little, uh, there we go. From 1562 to 1584, the Canary Islands were more important uh, than Seville in terms of uh, the frequency of maritime traffic to the Yucatan. All right, so let me go on. So that's just, just for example, and we can make a similar type of analysis for, for a lot of other ports in and around the Caribbean. All right, so as I mentioned, I'm gonna go through these really quickly, but as I mentioned, um, the, there are cities in some of the, um, of the population centers in Macronesia, particularly in the Canary Islands, uh, along with the Azores and the Cape Verde Islands, that were you know, pretty densely populated in comparison to uh, 16th century Spanish Caribbean settlements. So here you have images by an engineer named Leonardo Torgani. Um, he has wonderful, uh, wonderful uh, illustrations and the text, which is pretty interesting to read actually. So here's an image of Las Palmas de Gran Canaria, uh, uh, which they, I don't think they gave us information. I don't think he gives the information along with the image about how many hearths um, for Chi, I think it is, how many, right, how many households. But in these other cities, I'll show Santa Cruz de la Palma, 800 households, 800 hearths. Uh, let's see, I think I have a couple others, yeah. Um, so there's uh, San Cristobal de la Laguna, La Laguna, a thousand hearths. Interesting, he seems to like La Laguna quite a bit. Um, Santa Cruz de Tenerife, 200 hearths, uh, which is the port, right, directly adjacent to, um, to La Laguna. And then Carachico, which I'll talk a bit more about in a second, 400 hearths. Um, so these are you know, just ex some examples of the city layouts and they give some idea of the uh, density of the population. Um, and I won't go into much detail here, but there, there are one um, big advantage of working on this product, uh, project sorry, during, the, um, during the pandemic has been there's so much wonderful information that is available um, online. The uh, archives, um, the main archives, I've worked mainly in three archives and two in the two provincial archives uh, in Las Palmas de Gran Canaria and in uh, La Laguna, which is the Ar Ar Archivo Provincial de Santa Cruz de Tenerife. These two archives have a lot of material online. Um, and there's also this source I mentioned, well, two sources here, these Colloquios de Historia Canario Americana. Every, you know, every other year, they have this massive conference. Um, and now they combine, right, with the uh, uh, Historical Association of Latin American Caribbean Studies. So you have this you know, pretty massive group of, of, of scholars who meet and, and, and all of their papers, uh, essentially everybody who wants to publish their paper, they're all published and you can access you know, decades of scholarship and you know, 500, 600, 800 pages um, in each one of these issues. So this is all accessible online. So it's a really you know, huge um, uh, wealth of scholarship that's pretty useful. Um, also, uh, another wonderful resource, the Biblioteca Virtual Vieira y Clavijo. This site here is, is, has, among other things, they, have, um, they provide direct access to dozens of published primary sources for the 16th, 17th century and, and 18th century. So also you know, very useful. Um, here are the locations of the three archives that, I, that I've worked in so far mostly. Um, there are other archives in the Canaries, um, you know, not to mention elsewhere, right? But um, the archive this is sort of a, a, a small archive, the general archive of, of La Palma and Santa Cruz is right there. They don't have much of, they don't have an online presence at all. Um, um, but it's nice, it's a nice place. 
uh, La Laguna here is the uh, Archivo Historico Provincial de Santa Cruz de Tenerife. Um, here's an image of that building actually. And then here is in the um, Archivo Historico Provincial de Las Palmas de Gran Canaria. It's also a wonderful place. Um, so I have images of their websites down here. And both of those, you can um, access uh, primary sources online. Um, right now I'm having more, I mean, in the last uh, couple months, I've had better luck accessing the, um, the uh, notarial records in Tenerife than I have with the ones in Gran Canaria. But they're, you know, they, you can directly uh, download PDFs right, of thousands of pages of notarial records um, from both of these places. So, um, you know, anybody who works in this sort of project is not hurting for primary source material, even during the pandemic. Right. Um, but if you if you go to any of these archives, uh, they let you take pictures also, so you can you can you know the, you know help yourself, right? You feel free to take pictures of the documents. So it's it's really um, wonderful places to work and uh, and, a, and a lot of cool material which I'll get into. All right, so just something now. Let me give you just a couple examples real quick of the types of material I've been finding. Um, so here is an example. Uh, so I have just a few examples, all from the same set of documents, all from Garachico and Tenerife. Um, and here's an example in which a, a person from uh, from you know the Basque country, let's say from San Sebastián, who is the captain and owner of a ship, is in Garachico, and he agrees, you know, as of the writing of this document, he agrees to take seven passengers to Ocoa, which is just west of Santo Domingo on the island Hispaniola. And he, you know, he mentions two of them by name, and the others who travel in their company or in their service. Um, so, you know, we often think that you know it's often been um, uh, uh, theorized, at least, right, that Spanish Crown and the House of Trade has this, you know, uh, tight control, right, on who gets to go to the Americas and and such, pasajeros de Indias and such. Um, and it's it's been shown now that there's a lot of uh, uh, flexibility, and there were a lot of um, People who were able to get around uh, uh, these, um, these, uh, you know, the, the rules. But um, you know, here's one example of how that was possible. You, you get on board a ship in the Canary Islands. I mean, there's also examples of people who tried to get aboard a ship like this and were found to be stowaways and kicked off. But here's an example of someone who says, you know, should I agree to take them? We have other similar examples of um, of uh, all sorts of deals like that being made in the Canaries prior to a trip to the Caribbean. Uh, here's an example of a person who lives in a smaller town not far from Garachico in, in Tenerife, who, I, I love this one actually, who's, who's writing this document on behalf of his uncle, uh, who lives in, there's a vecino of Santo Domingo, and so this is in, in Garachico, Tenerife. He's writing on behalf of his uncle, who uh, is, you know, a permanent resident of Santo Domingo in the Caribbean, and he's citing this power of attorney that his uncle gave him when they were both in, in the, on the island of Terceira in the Azores on their way back from the Indies, as it says. And so it's really interesting because the person who's writing this uh, describes himself as a native of the island, like natural, like a person originally from the island of Tenerife, but his uncle is of the Portuguese nation. So his uncle is Portuguese, right? I, I don't interpret this to mean he was like a new Christian or a, a Hebrew of the Portuguese nation, as they say in Amsterdam around this time and a little bit later. But, um, uh, uh, it's interesting, regardless, that um, he's. I'm, I'm from Tenerife, you know, and then my uncle is Portuguese, right? Um, and you know, there's this is a lot of like 20 folios almost. Um, and some of them are in Portuguese, um, some of them are in Spanish. They mention several other people. Um, the documents written in Terceira in the Azores mention several other people who um, who had been traveling from the Caribbean to Seville. Um, and uh, and uh, found themselves found themselves in the Azores at that time. So really interesting. Uh, Gabriel Rocha has done uh, written a cool um, essay on a, on a related topic that I that I highly recommend. Um, another example. So I have a bunch of these. Um, I might I might actually skip a couple, but I have. Uh, um, I want to get to my little story at the end. Yeah. So there's I have similar examples of, and these are all just for Hispaniola. There's, there's you know hundreds. Uh, uh, I mean. Just in this one legajo, there's dozens of examples. I mean, literally dozens. Uh, probably, I'd say, I'd say 30 to 50. Probably, let's say 30 to 40 different uh, documents in which uh, people are referring to an upcoming trip uh, to 
uh, Hispaniola or Cuba or Puerto Rico or Nicaragua or Honduras or Cartagena de Indias or uh, Venezuela or to Jamaica sometimes or to Mexico, of course. Um, but there's, there's, there's just this um, large amount of information about people who are residing, are residing in the Caribbean, who used to live in the Caribbean, uh, people who are trading with people from the Caribbean, sometimes people who are residents of Caribbean uh, ports who find themselves at the moment in Garachico, all right? Um, so speaking of, uh, so this is my last sort of uh, extra example. Um, one of the projects I've been working on is, is trying to merge these three different historiographies. Um, excellent work on Cartagena de Indias by Antonio Vidal Ortega. Um, very interesting study of the island of La Palma and its relation to the Caribbean in the first half of the 17th century, and then mostly focusing on trade. Um, and then this book, uh, The Forgotten Diaspora, about Jewish communities on the Petit Côte of Senegal um, in the very early 17th century, um, and their connections to Amsterdam particularly, but also links to uh, the Caribbean and Cape Verde Islands. Um, as it turns, I've I realized they all three are talking about some of the same people, um, and that there's a connection to the island of La Palma in particular um, here that, uh, that enables to kind of connect uh, these different stories. So I think that, that could be done with a, a number of uh, historical themes. All right, so my last one, already about 30 minutes, so I'm gonna take just a couple more minutes to talk about my last, my, my favorite story. And this is the one I've spoken a little bit about this before. I published a preliminary essay on this not too long ago. I think an English version is coming out soon. But this is, this is I'm gonna be working on this for a while because it's, it fascinates me. Um, so it, while working in one of those archives, the one in Tenerife in, um, in La Laguna, I just you know happened to find this document um, where, a woman who describes herself in this document as Catalina de los Santos, uh, uh, mulata in color, widow, uh, the former wife of a man named Pedro de la Rosa, um, uh, vecina, a permanent resident of the island of um, Hispaniola in, in the city of Santo Domingo. And you, that's okay, that's all great. I said, like, okay, that's, that's fine. But what really struck me was that then she said, an owner of the ship named Our Lady, uh, Nuestra Señora de la Concepción, right? And an owner of this ship. Uh, that's here in the port of Garachico, uh, bound for the Indies. So I had never seen, this is still the only document I've ever seen of a woman who describes herself as being of African descent, um, owns a ship, right? And it's an, a, like a transatlantic sailing vessel. Um, so I, wow, so that, that caught my attention. You know, I look, this is the whole document here. She signs her name at the end. Um, you know, I was fascinating. So if I, uh, you know, poured over the document, tried to extract whatever information I could about her, um, and then published a little, a little uh, analytical, um, a little analysis of just the, of this one document. But later on, I was able to find out a lot, you know, a good bit more information about her. Um, it turns out that she purchased the ship in in Terceira, on the island of Terceira in the Azores, um, and that she sailed it to Seville. Although she was on board with another person who sailed it to Seville. Um, uh, and the ship was already on the way back uh, from, I believe, from Veracruz. I uh, know, on the way back from Santo Domingo, I think. So she was on board. I think she purchased it uh, probably while she was in Terceira, um, if it's the same ship. But, you know, there's a period of about two years when she was based in Seville. That's what I'm working on. I'm not trying to figure out what she was doing in Seville for two years, if she stayed in Seville during that time. She has all these links to, um, to merchants who lived in Seville, including some fairly powerful uh, merchants who have a lot of different uh, economic uh, interests and activities going on. She shows up in Garachico with a, among, you know, one of the things she had, she owned was a blank travel permit that basically permitted anyone to go wherever they wanted without having to, um, having to deal with the house of trade, the Casa de la Contratación, so which, you know, which she was selling at that time. Um, so I have, you know, the hunch that she was up to some very interesting things during those two years. Um, you, you know, maybe she stayed in Seville that whole time, maybe not. But we can definitely um, put her in Terceira, Seville, and Garachico. And then I think, um, and, you know, supposedly she, she had come from uh, Santo Domingo in Espanol. And I think I found her in Havana. I think she, from uh, Tenerife, I think she goes to Havana. Um, so I have here an image of Havana um, around that time. And then I found her, I think she remarries in Havana to a guy named Juan Catalan. Um, and I think she, she certainly can see here, I have Catalina de los Santos, not a very common name, uh, either in the Canaries or in, uh, or in Cuba, certainly at that, at that period, in the, in the available documents I've seen. Um, I, I've, I see her appearing as a uh, godmother several times to, um, 
to enslaved Africans uh, or, or people of African descent, and as a slave owner, as an owner of enslaved people in a couple of cases, often serving as their um, um, in sort of a, a, a maternal <laughs> sponsoring type role, sort of a madrina is what I want to say, as a, like, as a godmother in that sort of capacity. Um, so she appears to particularly be linked to, um, she appears to be, she's never described as black or mulata or morena. She's never described racially at all in, in these documents in Havana. Or, and I've, I found about 10 other documents of which she signs many of them there that mention her in Tenerife. And uh, including where she she sells uh, her ship actually before she leaves to leaves Tenerife, I think she um, I think she uh, she's involved in some sort of sneaky uh, sneaky uh, dealings or, or smart um, uh, business moves depending on your point of view. But um, she sells her ship in Tenerife, gets, leaves with a bunch of money, and says she's going to Havana. So I, I think I found her here. Um, but what I was going to say, she's never identified as she just identifies herself as mulata that one time. After that, she's always just called San Catalina de los Santos, um, including in Havana, if it is the same person. Um, but in Havana, she often appears to associate with free people of color. Um, and, and so like if, if an enslaved person owned by a free person of color is, gets baptized or, um, um, you know, or serves as a godparent, right? She, she might show up as, as the owner or godparent of another enslaved person. Or in, in one case, she is the actual godmother. Um, so um, she seems to, you know, be more involved with um, sort of free black society in late 16th century Havana um, than, you know, many other people. Um, you know, oh, I mean, her, her own godmother actually and godfather, her own sponsors at her marriage were actually pretty high ranking, um, high ranking people in Havana also. And I think the main sponsor was the, uh, the royal accountant of Havana. At that time, so so interesting person. Um, if I can ever get in the material records in Havana, the few that have survived, right? I would love to see if she appears in any of those. Um, but I think for now, I think we're going to find a lot more material in in uh, Tenerife and in uh, and in Seville, possibly in Tercera. So this is kind of the itinerary I've been able to put together for her. Um, so probably leave Santo Domingo, Tercera, Seville, uh, and then spend some time, and for about two years, probably in Seville then spend some time in Garachico. And then from there, I think to Havana. I mean, I'm tentatively making the identification because the dates match perfectly. Um, and, uh, and, you know, just in terms of contextually, I mean, she says she's going to Havana. Uh, she had a bunch of money from selling her ship and the rest would be paid to her in Havana, right? So this sort of types of information leads me to think it's probably the same person. Um, so just an example, let's see. I don't know if I have any further slides. So I might just, uh, finish it off right there. Um, so what I mainly want to get at with this, and I, I like the Catalina and Los Santos example, it's, it's still my favorite because um, we can um, think about a specific individual who's fascinating in her own right and worth, you know, just trying to follow her um, is, is in itself, I think is rewarding, but it also is a wonderful example of, um, of, of the way that, uh, uh, transatlantic uh, travel wasn't this sort of, you know, Seville to, you know, Veracruz or Seville to Cartagena um, necessarily, right? There were all these different regional circuits that transatlantic uh, travel and trade migration had to pass through. And this, this is how it worked. Um, and, and I like the example of Catalina Los Santos because she shows us one of the ways that different regional circuits, um, maritime regional circuits, connected to one another um, in ways that were almost completely beyond the purview of uh, the House of Trade back in Seville. Right? And I mean, not to say that people in Seville were not also very heavily involved in the same types of activities. Um, and, you know, Seville and Lisbon, I mean, yeah, God, these, these, these places in the Iberian Peninsula also form part of the same system, but it's also possible um, uh, to see itineraries that completely left out uh, ports in the Iberian Peninsula. Um, or in which they played a really minor role. Everybody had already, you know, um, as soon as the ships got to Tercera, maybe they went straight to the Canaries from there, right, or, or elsewhere, or to, or to Amsterdam, right? So there's, so there's a lot of um, uh, many, many variations of these sort of connections between different regional circuits uh, that I'm working on. And I think um, um, there's a lot of work to be done here. Um, if we had about uh, 50 people working on this, I think it would, you know, we, could, we could do it uh, a lot quicker. Um, um, some, you know, so 
I'll, I'll stop right there then. And if anybody has any questions or any recommendations, um, I would be uh, I'd be very happy to uh, discuss them you know, at at length if you want. All right. So thanks. Thanks very much.